Well, good morning and welcome to Sunday School. I'm glad that you're tuning in this morning. We are going to be diving into John chapter 7. John chapter 7, you can go ahead and turn there. We're continuing through the first 11 chapters of John. And today we're going to be looking at uh, a section where Jesus says that he was sent by God. He's already mentioned that before, uh, but we're going to look a little bit deeper at that. And so the question I want to start off with, though, is what makes a teacher effective or, or memorable? What, what makes a teacher effective or memorable? You probably thought of a teacher, maybe a uh, when you were in middle school, high school, college even, you think of a teacher and, and the way that they were very effective or memorable and they helped you learn. And so there, there is a major impact that teachers can have on us, whether it's um, maybe not our favorite teacher, but maybe their wisdom or their experience or their honesty or, or, or whatever happened, they had an impact on you. And so today, uh, we're going to be looking at a situation where Jesus was teaching in Jerusalem. And so his teaching and his authority wowed or amazed the people, and, and really it challenged um, the beliefs of the, um, the Jewish leaders. It, it really called um, them to action to believe in him. And so uh, we're going to see how Jesus confronted uh, the Jewish leaders with their hypocrisy and really their lack of power as well. And so let's look at the context real quick. Um, leading up to it, John 7, verses 1 through 13. We're not going to read those verses, but it does give the context for our passage. And so it shows how Jesus uh, secretly went to Jerusalem for the Festival of Shelters. It's also known as the Festival of Tabernacles or Booths. And so this festival was a reminder of um, of the exodus from Egypt and also was a celebration of the end of the harvest. And so this was a, an important time in the life of uh, Jews, right, for the Jewish um, faith and, and the people. And so it was a reminder of the exodus and a, a celebration of the end of the harvest. And so uh, leading up to it, though, uh, we see that his brothers, Jesus' half-brothers, uh, tried to pressure him into going, essentially saying, uh, if you're doing these things, shouldn't you do it in front of people? Also, we know from the verses 1 through 11, we see that the, uh, the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders, were trying to um, essentially uh, arrest him and even kill Jesus. And so uh, we see that Jesus was not going to be um, bullied by the religious leaders or um, uh, really intimidated either by them. And he, he came when his time was right. And so um, John 7 verse 6 says, my time has not yet arrived. And so Jesus came uh, when he needed to. He understood the situation and he came for a reason to testify about the gospel. And so let's look, leading up to this, let's look at John chapter 7 starting in verse number 14. John 7 starting in verse number 14. When the festival was already half over, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. Then the Jews were amazed and said, How is this man so learned, since he hasn't been trained? Jesus answered them, My teaching isn't mine, but is from the one who sent me. If anyone wants to do his will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own. The one who speaks on his own seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true. And there is no unrighteousness in him. Didn't Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why are you trying to kill me? We're going to stop there and ask a couple questions before we move on. But um, what we see in these verses is this encounter. So Jesus comes in the middle of the festival. Uh, he slips in and he begins teaching. And so what we see here is, is a, a kind of a question, a, a question I had, I know, is why wait until the festival was already halfway over? Why wait to secretly come into the city? And if you think about it, um, Jesus wasn't going to be bullied by his half-brothers. We've already talked about it. They were essentially saying, why aren't you going to go and, and do your things and, and speak among the people? So he wasn't going to be bullied by his half-brothers, but also he wasn't intimidated by the Jewish leaders um, because they were trying to kill him, right? So verse 11 talks a little bit about that. Essentially, Jesus wasn't trying to make a scene, and so he entered quietly. Yet, he was there for a reason. And what we see here is that he was sent by the Father. So, 
he waited until the festival was halfway over. But um, when we look at it and we see this, um, why would it be significant that Jesus was teaching in the temple? Why is it important to see that he was teaching in the temple? Um, verse 14 says, he went up into the temple and began to teach. He began to teach. I guess when you think about it, step back and recognize that, well, the temple would be the central place, uh, the focal place of, of the Jewish faith, right? So a very important area for uh, Jews. Um, I mean, there's some logistical reasons because if you think about it, that's where the people were located. Uh, they gathered in porches and, and courtyards to discuss religious issues. And so he went to where the people who um, he wanted to proclaim the truth to, he went to them. Um, and, and really, it boils down to Jesus was bringing uh, his kingdom message to uh, the top of the Jewish religion, meaning uh, he went to the central location, and it just makes sense that he was there. And so he cared, I would say, we don't see this specifically, but we do know that Jesus proclaimed truth to even the Jewish uh, leaders, and so in his care, he probably also was uh, bringing the message to them because they weren't willing to come to him. Uh, I think of Nicodemus when he came at night. And so the G Jewish leaders were not coming to Jesus. And so he brings the message uh, to where the people can hear and to where the truth can be heard. So we see Jesus um, coming in secretly teaching boldly and publicly. And then we see the response. And so uh, I guess uh, the question here, it says that um, verse 15, then the Jews were amazed and said, how is this man so learned since he hasn't been trained? And so the, the question I thought of is, what would it be like to have Jesus as your Sunday school teacher? What would it be like to have Jesus as your Sunday school teacher? Just to think about that, it would be pretty amazing, right? That's a pretty good word here. They were amazed. Um, it would be a great word for us to, to use because it implies this idea of bewilderment or confusion, like just amazement or wonder at what he was saying. So it would be amazing. Um, it would also be very applicable. Right? The, the things he taught, uh, the fact that he is God and he knows everything, uh, and he knows the scripture, it would be amazing how he would know what's going on in our lives and how he would apply it and address it in a way that's truthful and according to scripture. But in a sense, though, when you think about it, we do have Jesus as our teacher. That's why we are reading his words. And that's why we are studying scripture, studying the Bible, because we want to learn from Jesus. And so we, we are studying his words to learn from him. So verses 16 through 18, he, uh, Jesus speaks, he answers them. Now they may or may not have been actually asking a question um, in the sense of, um, excuse me, that was a little bit later. Uh, right here, verse 16, he is specifically answering the question they asked. Um, and so why do you think they were questioning if Jesus's teaching was really coming from God. Because notice, um, they, they were questioning where the, the, his, his teaching was coming from. Where is his source of authority? Um, and, and if you notice, um, they were amazed and said, well, he's not speaking like any of the other um, teachers or scribes or Pharisees. So why do you think the people were questioning this? Perhaps uh, it was very, because it was very different from the scribes. In Mark, we see a, a verse, Mark says that they were astonished at his teaching because he was teaching them as one who had authority and not like the scribes. So it was different, and so they were curious. Uh, but possibly, uh, it's a scenario where the people did not want to change their ways, so they questioned the origin of Jesus's teaching. Uh, they're wondering, uh, who's, on whose authority does he speak? That's a possibility regardless uh, of the reason behind their question, regardless of why they were wondering uh, how he can speak so uh, well, so learned, uh, we see Jesus' response. And so um, we look at this and says, My teaching isn't mine, but is from the one who sent me. If anyone wants to do his will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own. The one who speaks on his own seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks glory from the one who sent him is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. So we're going to stop there and read briefly. And uh, I guess the question I have for us is, is to ask this, 
how do we know if a person's teachings are from God? How, how do we know what someone is saying is from God? Well, today uh, we look at it and we say, does it line up with Scripture? Does it, does it line up with the Word of God? Um, here, Jesus is making a, a very good point, and he's essentially critiquing the, the scribes and the leaders and the uh, Pharisees of the time and saying they uh, often teach in order to receive glory for themselves. And yet Jesus is saying, I am, if, if anyone is seeking his own glory, um, then he is not speaking from God. He, you, Jesus, we, we all need to be giving glory to the Father. And so that's exactly what he's saying here, verse 17. Teaching is from God, or whether I'm speaking on my own. Verse 18, the one who speaks on his own seeks his own glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. And so uh, we look at that uh, to, to see if a person is speaking uh, from God. So, Scripture, are they seeking the, God, the Father's glory or their own? Um, and then do they confess Jesus? We see this in 1 John chapter 4. 1 John talks about that. So, um, here in, in this first section, we see that Jesus is making this clear statement that he is from the Father, he's speaking the, uh, according to the will of the Father, and he's glorifying the Father. And so, in verse 19, we see um, uh, this statement. Seems a little odd, but Jesus is probably responding to um, these Jewish leaders who were trying to kill him. So verse 19 says, didn't Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? Uh, I guess my question for you is, what does that tell you about the Jewish leaders? What does that, that inform you about what they were trying to do? Well, first of all, it talks about Moses' law. So Jesus says, didn't Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. So we see that they were uh, very hypocritical. They were um, basically uh, um, condemning Jesus for what they believed to be a, a, a breaking of the law, of the Sabbath law. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But they were hypocrites because they were accusing Jesus, yet they were doing the very same thing. I would say that it also shows that they were jealous or afraid of Jesus and his authority and his power and the people coming to him. And so they wanted to get rid of him. So we, we learn a little bit about that. He, Jesus is there speaking um, for the, uh, uh, from the Father, for the glory of the Father, uh, bringing this message of hope, yet the people, the Jewish leaders specifically, were trying to kill him. So let's move on to verses 20 through 24 where it talks about the righteousness, judging with righteousness. So let's uh, see verse 16, excuse me, verse 20. You have a demon, the crowd responded, who is trying to kill you. So he's saying, you're, you're crazy. Whether they are saying specifically, you have a demon, you're possessed, or whether this is just a way of them saying, you're a crazy person, you're paranoid. What they're saying is, who is trying to kill you? You make this statement that someone's trying to kill me, but who is it that's trying to kill you? Verse 21 says, I performed one work and you are all amazed, Jesus answered. This is why Moses has given you circumcision. Um, circumcision, Not that it comes from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses won't be broken, are you angry at me because I made a man entirely well on the Sabbath? Stop judging according to outward appearances. Rather, judge according to righteous judgment. I guess uh, as I was reading these verses, I kind of was wondering in verse 20, why is it that the crowd started to attack Jesus' state of mind? They essentially called him crazy or possessed. Either way, they're questioning who was trying to kill him, saying he was paranoid. Um, interestingly, in verses 25 through 26, uh, we see that uh, other people in Jerusalem knew of the plot to kill Jesus, so it wasn't crazy, but what was going on was that the, the, the leaders, the Jewish leaders, the people, the crowd, instead of trying to refute his argument and his statements, they resorted to using character attacks to discredit um, Jesus, to discredit his validity, right? So they're attacking the person instead of the words and the argument. And that's, that's the approach. That's what's happening here. 
And yet, uh, Jesus comes in and he points out very logically and very consistently the inconsistency, the hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders. And so, uh, before we look at those verses uh, specifically, I I do want to ask this question. What makes it hard, um, or what makes seeing our own hypocrisy hard or difficult? Well, why is it so hard to see our own hypocrisy? Well, um, I would say that because oftentimes we don't, we're not thinking that we're being a hypocrite. We don't believe we are being hypocritical. We are often blind to our own hypocrisy because we have rationalized it, and we've rationalized our actions to ourselves and to others and trying to make excuses for it. So we're blind to it. Uh, think about it this way. Uh, the, the self-righteous um, uh, piety of the, the Pharisees uh, by, necessity, my, by necessity says, I'm okay and everybody else is at fault. And so it points the fingers at others instead of themselves. And, and we do the same. We point the fingers at others instead of ourselves. And so Jesus is responding by pointing out their hypocrisy as it related to circumcision. And so just a little bit of background on what's being said here in verses uh, 22 through 23, and he, he brings up this conversation about circumcision. And, and so technically, the act of circumcision violated the Sabbath law um, related to work. And so um, the Jewish leaders, however, believed that the command or the law related to circumcision took precedence over the Sabbath law. And so they viewed it as a necessary mercy, something that was permitted on the Sabbath. And so uh, Jesus, um, he didn't argue necessarily for the necessity of the, the healing of the person, but, but he used a form of argument saying, okay, well, if you think that the, the law related to circumcision is more important than the law related to the Sabbath, then, well, think about this. If you can circumcise on the Sabbath, which only deals with one part of the body, then Jesus said um, that he could heal the whole man uh, because his actions take precedence as well. His actions were no more a violation of the Sabbath law than circumcision. And his argument is intended to point up the hypocrisy of the these religious leaders. And so um, his... his uh, his conversation, his approach, um, his his attack, so to speak, uh, was very powerful and very important because it they didn't have any defense. Uh, what they had done, and what we've talked about in previous lessons, is that they had um, focused so much on the traditions and the rules and the regulations that they forgot the intention and the purpose of the law. And and so Jesus is reminding them of um, the the fact that. Um, they had forgotten what was more important and had used these traditions to uh, essentially um, uh, promote injustice and, and, and not show compassion to people. So that's the argument. That's what he's doing. And, and so verse 24 kind of finishes or, or summarizes this situation where he says, Stop judging according to outward appearances. Rather, judge according to righteous judgment. So he says, essentially, and finishes this by telling the religious leaders to judge righteously, righteously, not according to the outward appearance. Now, we are probably familiar with passages in the Old Testament. Nathaniel, who was um, uh, uh, under the authority of God, uh, the direction of God, seeking a king to replace um, the, um, King Saul. And so um, God told, tells him not to judge, not to see the outward appearance, but the, the Lord sees the inward. And so they move on to another individual. And so we see passages like that. Uh, we see passages in Isaiah that talk about this, how the Messiah would come and judge righteously. And so these verses in, in Scripture uh, speaks to this fact that um, God sees the inside not the outward appearance. And so uh, what was going on was that the Jewish leaders were more concerned with the outward appearance of keeping the, the law of God that they rejected that which was good, that which was right and just on the Sabbath, which was Jesus healing this man on the Sabbath. So I guess a question for us, if, if, if this command was given to the Pharisees, stop judging according to outward appearances, rather judge according to the righteous judgment. How do we make sure that we are judging 
righteously. We are making right judgment. That's an important question for us to consider. And when you think about it, essentially, the only thing I can say for myself is that I have to judge according to the Word of God rather than human traditions. And it's very easy to fall into the temptation of, of saying that these traditions, um, uh, these are what we're going to abide by, these are what we know, these are what we're going to use, and, and yet they can creep in and overtake the Scripture itself. And so that's what Jesus was accusing these religious leaders of doing. They were making outward ju- uh, judgments based on the outward appearance rather than that which was righteous judgment. This now leads us to the final section of our passage. Uh, we've looked at um, Jesus coming in and, and speaking as from the Father, and, and he was uh, calling, essentially calling them uh, to, to believe that he is from the Father. We saw that he was uh, condemning them for their hypocrisy and their, their judgment based on outward actions and outward appearance rather than uh, the inward motivation in the heart. And so now, verse, um, verses um, 25 through 29, we see um, Jesus go a little bit further. So let's read as we go into it. Verse 25 says, Some of the people of Jerusalem were saying, Isn't this the man they are trying to kill? Yet look, he's speaking publicly, and they're saying nothing to him. Can it be true that the authorities know he is the Messiah? But we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, nobody will know where he is from. As he was teaching in the temple, Jesus cried out, You know me, and you know where I am from, yet I have not come on my own. But the one who sent me is true. You don't know him. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. These are the, the final verses we're going to study. There's more to the story and, and, and the scene. They try to seize him, uh, yet because it's not yet his time, no one laid a hand on him. But what we look at and what we find in these verses is, is pretty interesting. So I guess let's start off by asking this. How would you describe the people's response in verses 25, 26, and 27? How would you describe their response? When you look at it, I would say there's some curiosity Right? They're, they're curious as to why Jesus would speak in the public uh, while the Jewish leaders are trying to kill him. They're probably also curious why the Jewish leaders, now that he's in public, aren't even saying anything to him. Um, and so what's, what's going on? You know, so they're curious as to what is going on. There's confusion, uh, wanting to know why the Jewish leaders um, uh, weren't saying anything because, uh, well, if he's a false prophet, so to speak. They should do something about it, but they're not doing anything, so maybe he is the Messiah. So there's some confusion, some curiosity, but also there's some incomplete knowledge. Uh, Verse 27, it says, but we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, nobody will know where he is from. Apparently, there was this, uh, this common held belief that the Messiah would come from unknown origins and obscurity. Uh, It's possible also, though, um, that they were referring to the fact that in Micah 5.2, the prophecy is that uh, the Messiah would come from Bethlehem. So whether they're saying Jesus, we know who Jesus is and and he's known to us, uh, also they might be saying, well, we know he's not from Bethlehem, he's from Galilee. Um, But um, they wrongly had that information because Jesus was born in Bethlehem, right? And fulfilling the, the prophecy of Micah 5 2. And so there was this incomplete knowledge of who Jesus was. And so um, we're going to ask a couple more questions related to that. But in verse 28, we see um, what Jesus says. As he was teaching in the temple, Jesus cried out. So he's responding, essentially. He's, he's, he's making a statement. You know me, and you know where I am from, yet I have not come on my own. But the one who sent me is true. You don't know him. I know him because I am from him, and he has sent me. Um, And so what's interesting, though, if you look at verse 28, what is he saying? He's essentially saying that they don't know the Father. He's saying, yes, you know where I'm from, but you don't understand everything that's going on. You don't know the one who sent me. Uh, the one who sent me is true, and you don't know him. It's a uh, pretty, pretty bold, but he's essentially saying they don't have a relationship with the Father. And so, let's ask this question for us to consider: What is the danger of having a legalistic 
approach to religion. What is the, the danger of having a legalistic approach to religion? We kind of see the result of that and the danger of it because it can't save, right? Jesus talked about this. We talked about it last week and we'll talk about it again, but it can't save. It, it lulls people into a false sense of security because they think they are right with God. And, and it's ultimately the danger of legalistic uh, approach to religion. Religion is one, it's against scripture, but um, it's, it focuses on rituals and rules instead of a personal relationship with God. And, and what we see here is Jesus is saying, you don't know him. You don't know the Father. Uh, and so it's a very bold statement, but it's a very important statement. And, and we need to ask the question, do we know the Father? And so what he says in verse 29 um, is pretty helpful. Jesus says, I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. He is claiming to be sent from God. He, he, in other passages, he claims to be from heaven. Uh, he claims to be um, the son of man. He's claiming to be uh, the one, the Messiah who would be sent. And so he's claiming these things and, and the people recognize, uh, they tried to seize him. Uh, they recognize these claims as being very much against the traditions, the thoughts. And so if they're false, if they're not true, then he is blaspheming uh, against the word of God. He's, he's, a, he's a, a liar. He's a blasphemer. But we know that he is the Messiah. That's the point of the book of John. He's writing this so that we may know him and believe. Uh, as I was thinking about this passage, I was asking, uh, I was kind of asking myself, what do people think, um, or excuse me, who do people think Jesus is today? And, and more importantly, how does that affect their ability to embrace him as Savior? Who do people think that Jesus is? I've asked this question before, and people have answered um, that Jesus is just a good teacher. He's got some good things to say, but he's just a teacher. Others have said he's kind of like a prophet, like Moses. Um, some have argued, well, he's not even real. Uh, they deny his existence altogether. Um, and so the problem is, is that a failure to understand that Jesus is the Son of God who came from heaven who took on human flesh, who died for our sins, and was raised again. The failure to recognize that will result in a failure to repent and to place one's faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And so that's the danger, that's the failure, and that's the problem that Jesus is trying to address here in this situation. Having this dialogue and this conversation with the, the people, um, the Jewish leaders, he is trying to warn and to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what we would refer to it as. So how do we apply this passage? Well, first of all, uh, I would say this. Jesus was sent by the Father so that we could know the Father. He is the, the one who uh, uh, teaches and, and informs us, and, and he is speaking um, on behalf of God's will, and he is proclaiming the Father. So Jesus was sent by the Father so that we can know the Father. And so there's three statements I want us to talk about. Believers can trust the teachings of Jesus. He, he is genuine, and he, he, um, he is speaking for the Father's glory, not his own. Believers must examine their lives for hypocrisy. When we see the um, response Jesus brings to the Jewish leaders, he points out their hypocrisy as it comes to the, the Sabbath laws, how they break it for their own things, the things that they justify, yet they won't allow Jesus to heal the whole person on a Sabbath. And then believers confidently proclaim that believers confidently proclaim that Jesus was sent by the Father. And so he is the one true God, the Messiah who can save us. And so the question I want to leave you with, and I hope you can consider, is this. How does the fact that Jesus was sent by the Father and speaks the will of the Father change your daily life? How should it change your daily life knowing that Jesus is from the Father and speaks the will of the Father? Well, when you think about it, if, if we truly believe that Jesus is who he says he is, then the time we spend... Um, should reflect that, right? I mean, if we truly believe that he is speaking the words of the Father, that he is God, then we should know more about him. We should spend time with him. So I pray 
through this study of Scripture, you're, you're already desiring to dive into Scripture, that you will continue to grow in your desire to learn and to apply God's Word in your life. And I pray the same for myself. So thank you for tuning in this morning. I'm going to pray for us and we'll be dismissed. Dear God, thank you for who you are, for what you're doing in our lives. God, I pray that as we study Scripture, we apply this Scripture, that we evaluate our lives, uh, desiring to know you more, to uh, avoid the hypocrisy in our life, uh, to trust in you, to desire to um, uh, proclaim the good news of Jesus to those around us. So God, thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.